is being recorded. So just to reiterate, I'm extremely excited and honored to be hosting you this evening, Prof. Oliphant. I teach your work um, at UCT at third year level. Uh, I teach the contributions you made to the Black consciousness movement and how, and, and I teach, I write what I like and your work and your activism within the literary space from then, from the 60s, beyond the, before the 60s and until today has been incredibly important for, for, for me and for many other poets. So it's a real honor to have you in this space. And I haven't had the, the, the privilege of hearing you read um, and in your own voice, I've only met you on the page. So thank you so much for taking the time to join us this evening at the, the Red Wheelbarrow. Um, I will not <laughs> write, uh, read out your bio. We have sent it out and it is an extensive and wonderful and glorious bio of incredible achievements. And I think that many of us in the room are quite familiar with the work that you've done over many years. Um, I will begin uh, the session by reading a poem. And could I just, uh, could, could I just uh, uh, say good evening to everybody? Please do. And uh, express my appreciation for inviting me to participate in the program. Okay. We thank you. Um, so the way that we typically do this is I will read an opening poem to um, welcome you in and you will read um, and then afterwards there will be a Q&A and &A. Um, a, a brief Q&A, and then we'll take a break, and there will be an open mic. So um, I'm reading a poem by Mark Espen, who read for the Red Wheelbarrow uh, yesterday evening at Bertha House, and we were really honored to have him read. And I'm reading from an old staff writer from... 1990, the year that I was born, um, as my sister kindly allowed me to, to, to dig into her archive. And I stumbled upon this poem by Mark Espen called Third Eye in the Bloom. On the outskirts of the metropolis, the churned up earth is dumped. Wheels turn against the day, lift all from extreme depth. Down below, men sweat profusely, break stone for bread and sleep, headlamp, headlamps the third eye in the gloom. Gumboots squelch in the puddles, the cockapans roll along the rails, pushed by men with wet bandanas on their heads. Outwardly, the miners endure abuse from racist gangsters, in the narrow caverns, the, the stench of rotting wood pervades the ritual of work. The high felt night is cold. Winds wail through disused structures. Activity at pit head increases as the shaft elevator ascends. The headlamps are doused for another session of sleep. In the middle of the mine, Danger patiently awaits human error. Corporate executives are nonchalant, like vicious gods about a sacrifice. And with that, I hand it over to you. Thank you. Good evening once again. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. we can. I can hear you. Thank yes, we can. Thank you. So good evening to all of you. And uh, once again, my appreciation for inviting me uh, to participate in the readings that you host uh, regularly. I had assumed that people had forgotten about me. 
got buried in the bureaucratic work and policy and had very little time for, for, for creative writing. But uh, that is really the environment in which I, 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 I live and find meaning in the world. So what I will do is uh, read about 10 poems or, you know, cut, cut some out if it's going on for too long. Going back to uh, my early work published in the 80s, in the collection at the end of the day. I'll read the, the title poem. This was at a time, of course, when uh, there was a renewal in the uh, uh, popular movement to, to end apartheid. And uh, the poem anticipates, you know, that uh, a time will come when uh, we will look at uh, what happened during the 21st, 20th century and for, for a long time in South African history would come to an end. At the end of the day, with smoke pushing into scarlet Highfeld skies, I make my way from the railroad tracks towards a migrant hostel. I pass two men unwrapping their supper from newspaper. I wander aimlessly among the barracks of a crowded transit camp. The melancholy of dusk. Is there nothing more to it than this rustic texture of red brown dust and fading light? What about the early stars above this oval planet? I prepare myself for the imminence of night by pocketing bad memories and checking my thoughts. I follow the awkward flights of the first bats. I think of bread, the sharp bark of a dog somewhere in the gathering night probes me to ponder on the physics of movement, the perpetuity of time, and people always turning towards light. The next song, or the next poem, uh, or oh, the word song is in the title, that I, I said the next, next song. The next poem is entitled Song of the Un Unemployed. So every, as you know, had an economic system which was always based on exclusion and exploitation. And we all expected that change in South Africa would uh, bring about a more equitable and inclusive uh, society on all levels, politically, economically, culturally. So this was written in the 80s. Uh, at a time when uh, the labor system in this country was, was super exploitative. Song of the Unemployed. This room with its brooding cold stove and aluminium pots unnerves me. The broom standing in the corner and the black coat hanging from the wall. What's in the cupboard below the window? I stand in the doorway and look from the window. I see a gray dustbin at a hinges gate. An aloe with spear-shaped leaves catches my eye. What does it want to say? Later today, I will take a plastic bucket and fetch water from a tap down the street. I will step around puddles and avoid hungry looking dogs. Where do all the emaciated animals come from? At dusk, when the first trains pull up, I will stoke a fire, cook a huge pot of porridge, some vegetables, and a small portion of meat. Then I will wait for my wife and children to return from work.
The third poem from uh, At the End of the Day, which will be the last poem from the, the collection, uh, draws on my childhood, where I was born in Heidelberg, uh, east, of, uh, east of Johannesburg. I was born in a house where ancestors were suspended from the walls. On hot afternoons, they would descend and walk silently through the cool passages of the dark house, slowly as if strolling through a home. The roof is a vantage point for birds and pigeons. On the stoop in an ancient folding chair, my namesake sits. There is a giant gum tree at the gate in which the sun sets. The stars are candles which my grandmother has lit. Every morning, father wakes up to find a man with a hole in his head sleeping in the drift sand of the furrow which runs along the creosoted split pole fence. I go in search of the orchestra of crickets. In the kitchen, mother cries as she turns the toast on the black plates of the welcome Dover. Father packed my pigeons into boxes. I ended up with Rover and the cats on the back of a truck with all the household goods. I thought if this is part of life, it's fun. At the end of the truck's journey through the sky, we arrived in a town of matchbox houses lined up like tombstones in a graveyard. At once I understood why my mother cried. That's the three poems from uh, that uh, volume of poetry. And I would like to read two from uh, a new coin, which was published in the 80, I think in the 80s sometime. Is it, yeah, no, in 1996. And this was written after I returned from the USA where I, I, I've been studying and it's titled Coming Home. He, he arrives with herring and vodka on his breath. Time is dust in his chest and throat. There are polar bears snorting over the shivering towns. Yeah, dogs bark at the night car. Light is a satellite. In the upright sleeplessness of traveling, he held his breath and felt an eel coil in the red water of his chest. It's green in the garden where the house kneels in the season. The doors are bolted and the windows shut between broken blocks of dolomite and salt, the doorstep rises like a ridge. He moves and hears his shadow scream. Bending under a rusting sky, he grasps the hard earth and quenches his thirst with stones. And the next poem, uh, This Life, is dedicated to an American friend of mine who worked was in South Africa at some time and worked with the uh, South African Writers Association in a publishing house, which I uh, was responsible for. This life for Kitty. Our bodies are tables of kisses, wine and food. I foresee our lives above the tides of a forgotten sea where we sleep in the scent of plum trees on the spores of ancient beasts. The blunt blar on the old graves pointing forward, pointing back, like the desires and memories we live out and keep. Your fragrant mouth in the afternoon of dreams. Our naked bodies in sheets of wind and heat the secret hour when we grapple with the meaning of our dreams. Autumn is the season in which all things go to seed. 
a night of stars and warthogs on our journey across the dusty earth. Your face constantly above mine in the dark. We find what we need, a table, chairs, a bed with clean sheets. We eat nuts and, a, and an assortment of delicious leaves. The afternoon of trees where our strange tongues meet and I find your face between the grass above and below us, the rocks breathe. The next poems I want to read come from uh, the collections that were put together by uh, uh, Patricia Schonstein, wonderful uh, 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 poetry collections, embracing hundreds of, of poets conceived around different team, themes, but, but essentially focusing on, on you know, the, African, the African aspect. Of, of South African culture and writing. It's another, it's another homecoming poem. Oh, it's the same poem that I read from, uh, from the uh, anthology, from the uh, volume, uh, Coming Home. So I'll skip that and continue to the next one, which links up with the previous poem. It's a type of love poem, I suppose. My beloved. A freckled antelope gazes in the valley where the leaves are alive with finches perched on the branches of a mangrove Pied kingfisher below the surface of the rippling water. In the sky, a lightning bird circles. I dream of my beloved with water on the skin, naked in the sand, a reed basket and a shoal of skipjacks. She is the speckled antelope with incandescent eyes and speckled horns. The bristle in a high, dark velvet. She is a flock of finches against the last light. I kneel before her fierce beauty. My beloved is a pied king for sure. Waiting, her eyes are clear water. She is the branches and the roots of the mangrove. My beloved is the magical life of water. She is the lightning bird circling above the valley where I wait for a fiery fury. That's the poem from uh, Africa, My Africa, the anthology published, I think, uh, is the first in a series of three, uh, three collections published in uh, 2012. The next poem comes from the Heart of Africa, the second volume in uh, Schoenstein's collection of contemporary South African poetry. I think there are two poems here, yes. See if I can find my way through this. You can't find the other one. I'll just read the, the, the one poem that I've marked. Oh, there's the second one, I see. The first poem is 
titled Night Map. With the rising rivers in summer, the earth sings as time accumulates in our weathered bodies. Evenings lean languidly against letter boxes. Lampposts enter into casual conversations. One after the other, the stars ignite in surreptitious proliferation. Those with chalk feet retreat to their rooms. Dressed in dusk, we go in processional mode along broken streets carved into forests with the axes of our bodies. We dine on a sidewalk, fish, mushrooms, and broccoli. We drink mineral laced wine. After midnight, we shower each other with kisses and strange vows. Light pours from our eyes, mapping the night where I lie on my side, coupled to you, standing up. The next poem is entitled Bedding. It so happens the earth holds its breath as it flares up and darkens. My heart beating in my chest is about bursting into flower. The sun burnishes in the deep green body of the season. The earth steams at sunrise and throbs with desire at sunset. Who has the most combustible heart? You ask, not expecting an answer. I laugh in the house when nakedness flourishes and fine clothes perish. Yeah, pillows and sheets are scented plums, pomegranates, apples, thyme, marble peaches, olives and apricots. The air is a solid body. The two of us, unspoken propositions. Now, if I can, I still see if I can find the phone in the other volume. I find it hard to, 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 to find my own name in, in indexes. I have to look about 10 times because I'm looking at other people's names. Oh, there we are. No, that, that poem was I had already read. Just go to the next volume. Uh, this, this is from, I think, the uh, third volume, Absolute Africa, published in 2016. The poem I want to read is, is entitled Of Freedom. This is now after 1994. Of Freedom. The high white walls rigged with death ask me, what is freedom? I stare at my feet. 
my shredded shoes sneeze. Their dry tongues tease. Freedom is the size of your body and also the bloody tracks on the clouds left by the funeral hawk. What is freedom? The steel gates wrapped in razors rattle. The broken fingernails of my calloused hands scribble in the air in front of me. Freedom is the measure of a human life and also the fringed kingfisher darting down towards the river, its blue-tipped wings scattering the lingering light. What is freedom? The sleek dogs in well-kept gardens bark. My shriveled belly fumbles. Freedom is a four-square meal, and also the rusted croak of the secretary bird foraging in the grassland for lizards. What is freedom? The intercoms crackling with static demand. The sticks of my legs knock against each other. They bear out a bony reply. Freedom is walking to the ends of the earth and also the swooping flight of the pearl-breasted swallow, wrapping loops of air around your chest. What is freedom? What? The cunning cars in the driveway stutter. My shadow rises to face me. It whispers, freedom is a membrane and also the smoky eagle owl perched on the posts of sunset from where it hoots out all the horrors of history. What is freedom? Freedom asks. I shrug my shoulders. I flap my arms. I press my face deep into the swift mirror of the morning where the wind bangs the windows chanting freedom's name. And the next poem is entitled Hearts from the same, uh, same volume. Heart is head and dreaming feet. Heart is hund and healing. Heart is silence and desire. Heart is stone. Heart is happiness and pain. Heart is earth and abstract. Heart is a face. Heart is door, street and great and gate. Heart is birth and burning sheets. Heart hunkering is a river. Heart laughing is vermilion. Heart is throat and honeysuckle, heart is arms and heart is eyes, heart is fury, fire and frost, heart is rain, sky and kisses, heart is breast and fragrant jasmine, heart is breathing, heart is noun, verb and adjective, heart beats. And the, uh, the next poem I want to read is called Text Returns. You know, that thing I have to do uh, annually. I mean, we don't know what's going to be done with it, May. Tax returns. It's Friday and I am late with my tax returns. From my window, I look out on the departing day. It's coughing trees and spewing traffic. Workmen are sealing the roof of the gallery so that the landscapes and still lives, unlike the nudes, do not evaporate. Here are my personal details. I am customized, registered and signed up. I declare I am accurate and honest. I am a wizard of income and deductions. And on, an end crawls up my neck, like the details of my capital gains. 
I am cascading financial statements, travel allowances, retirement annuities, investments. I incur medical expenses. I am the apparition of the face of fascist seas in a crowd on the platform of the railway station where I dine with a sullen daughter of my mother's wife. Using a black pen, I write in capitals. Letter by letter, I keep within the spaces. I cross things out. I use correction fluid. I confine, confound the scanners. Here are the details, riddled with mistakes. Last night, though I copulated with a ghost on the Raiden Sake lawn, of the slippery hillside that runs under the laundry, the scullery, the pantry, and the kitchen of the dreaming colonial house, where ants devour the dividends. That's the reading that I've put together tonight for, for this session. I hope I didn't bore you. Thank you so much for that reading. May I ask all of us who are in the room to unmute themselves and give a round of applause. Thank you. Um, My pleasure. Thank you so much for being with us and for sharing your work with us. It is such a gift and such a, a joy to hear you read from the, the span of your work over many years. Um, I'd like to open up a Q&A and I would like to open it up to the floor if there are any questions or comments, any praise, that anybody in the room would like to share, please raise your hand, either raise your hand on the camera, but ideally please raise your hand with the reaction emoji and then the floor is yours. Aha, I see two hands from colleagues of mine from the Red Wheelbarrow. Uh, Jacques, has, uh, you can ask your question. And then after that, Ed, please take it away. Uh, Prof Andres, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, okay, that's good. So I have a, I have a question about, um, I hear continuities, resonances between the more overtly political poems um, and the love poems. And I can't easily put those resonances into words, but it's almost as if, I mean, I have a, it's almost as if loving someone fully is, it, is in itself a kind of resistance. I wonder if you, so it doesn't feel to me as if those, those kinds of poems are in separate rooms. It feels to me as if they are, they, they are in conversation with each other. Um, and I wonder if you agree and if you, if you wrote them intending that or you know, how, they, how they talk to each other for you. Thank you. I think you're perfectly correct. The, the, poet, the, the political poems are, are love poems in some ways, you know, maybe angry love poems about, uh, you know, the state of the world, the conditions, you know, in the past and conditions now. Uh, I believe a political poem is, a, is, a, is a, if it's not a, a patriotic poem, which is a patriotism is love, is love for, for, for your country, for, for the people, for, for the land. And 
there's, there's, there tends to be in certain quarters a, a, an attempt to censor, to censor political writing. Now, I don't think it's, it's, uh, it's wise, you know, if the world is burning, if people are being murdered and oppressed, isn't that something that is horrible, that is, is antithetical to, to, to love? So when I write love poetry, I'm not uh, shouting and screaming and, and, uh, and uh, burning down things. It's an expression of, of disappointment. It's painful to, to, to see what is going on in our country now. And uh, like in the past, the politicians seem to be blind. And in the past, uh, writers in South Africa, artists, musicians, again, censorship and, 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 and critical, uh, 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 critical uh, uh, dismissals of, of socially and politically engaged uh, uh, writing is a form of love poetry. It's sometimes quarrelsome, like in love, but uh, there's no, for me, there's no, no line between, between the, between the two. Uh, as I say, I'm, I'm not a, a nationalist, but uh, as a humanist, uh, when people are being abused and one cannot uh, assert your, your human values, it's just rhetoric and, and, and meaningless. So indeed, your, your, your observation is, is correct. It, it, it's interrelated, the, 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 the uh, two themes which predominate my, my work. Even in the love poems, there's a lot of politics going on there. Mm. A, a lot of demonstration. Thank you. That's that's wonderful. Can't hear you. Can't hear you. Can't hear you. Apologies for that, Ed. Um, you have a hand up, and then after Ed, there is a question from Daniela Dunia. Prof. Andres, it's wonderful to finally hear your voice and to hear you read some of those poems that I first encountered in um, Patricia's, Patricia Schoenstein's anthologies and elsewhere. Um, I, yeah, I, I was curious to, to know or wanted to know if you wanted to say something more about the, uh, I love the imagery in your poems, um, in particular the love poems. Um, yeah powerful and, and often gorgeous and lots of birds and um, surprising very often. And so if I have a question, it's to do with um, influences. Do you, do you like the surrealists? Um, it, it feels to me like you have an experimental streak with language. Um, and, and what drew you to poetry? So a two part question. Yeah, I would say, you know, in terms of my, my, my sort of outlook or my sort of uh, the way I, I negotiate my, my existence here on, on Earth, it involves, it involves uh, the environment, it involves the social conditions. Uh, but I, I also write and work extensively in, 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 in the visual arts, in, write in South African painting and photography. So all these things uh, are roped into, into the poetry, the, the environmental, the affectionate, the political. And uh, the, there's a lot of protesting going on there, although it's not uh, the, the, the kind of uh, Fisted, uh, fisted, the sloganizing. Uh, for me, poetry if, and art, if it cannot embrace uh, the fullness of life and sort of shuts itself down into a corner, uh, 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 while, while 
no one should be should be harassed and 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 cajoled into into uh, subscribing to any uh, sort of line in, in in art and in literature. But I think a full life on Earth is to embrace everything: the environment, animals, nature, and your fellow man, and uh, the beauty. That is what literature and art actually does. It's uh, just imagine living on Earth when nature is screwed up completely. It's just a, a kind of a, a rubbish dump, which it's fast becoming in any case, even dumping stuff in space now. And there's just no no sensitivity to the consequences of that. So um, love too, love too. It's a political, it's a relationship between two people, between a community. It's, it has a social political dimension. But art distinguishes itself from, from those, those, those forces and factors by, this, by virtue of its aesthetic, its artistic uh, orientation. And that artistic, aesthetic orientation is a celebration it's a celebration of of, uh, of life, the gift of life, and uh, speaking out against uh, 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 actions and activities and processes which uh, which really sully the world, which really make it awful. You know, when you travel through South Africa, travel through all of Africa, parts of uh, uh, Latin America, and you see what what has become of societies. You know how 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 wrenching it is, and yet the, the Earth has everything we need. Everything we need to make our houses, to to make our machines, to uh, enrich ourselves. To you know, it has everything, and yet. We fail, we fail. We think that domination and exploitation is the way to be in the world. And uh, I think art, if it is worth the name, is concerned about, it's concerned about issues of justice, issues of the defilement, you know, of the exploitation and defilement of the, uh, of the environment. So, uh, all these things, all these things are political, not in the capital letter sense of the word, but as concerns of the polity, that is the community of living people, community of, uh, of uh, cultural formations is, is, is politics. So uh, there had been in our country, especially during apartheid, you all will know when, um, section of the writers in South Africa opted a, a very militant and very uh, explicit anti-apartheid posture and, and, and the opposition to, 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 to the injustices of that system. And there was another group of writers who believed that uh, art is, you know, art has nothing to do with the, with the world outside, outside uh, outside the paper on which it's written. It's just a stack of words with a sense of beauty. I it from I would suggest any, it's not possible to make a drawing of paper on a canvas without a certain, uh, it even emerges there unintentionally. That looks like some geographical or some uh, some physical object. The visual, the visual makes makes concrete. In other words, it, it has this this reference to reality, no matter how one abstract one works. So, uh, of course, it's not enough for a poem to list all the in the inequities and all the injustices. That's just that the politicians do that every day. But 
part is 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 trying to 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 to, to intervene or to register in an indirect and in a in a, in a, a static uh, mode a, a static mode what uh, what makes life worth living on this earth so yes my my work is 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 even the the love poems are political poems, as you know, uh, relating to mankind in certain cultural uh, vile and the violence inflicted on women and children by you know by by a collapse. That is a collapse of cultural sensitivity that is fueled by a state that seems to be to be stumbling into oblivion. So your observation is correct that, uh, yes, political poems are love poems and the love poems are political poems in, 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 in certain ways. But one wouldn't want to to reduce it, you know, to, 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 because art, visual art, music, poetry has to distinguish itself from, from other forms of discourse and other phenomena in order to claim its place. But it's a complex, you know, literature is, is complex, it's not one dimension. Thank you, it was very illuminating. Thank you so much. Um, our next question is from Daniela Demir, and I will point at you and you can take it away. Thank you so much, Prof. Um, we've actually corresponded before and you very kindly agreed to let me reprint your amazing introduction to Horns for Honda, which was so seminal um, and so wonderful for all of us who have intended to write about Lisa Rampolo King's work. Um, my question is sort of a follow-up question to Jacques and Ed's questions. Um, what you have been um, responding to their questions reminds me of a quote um, by James Baldwin, which then a Palestinian writer Susan Abulhawa picked up um, in for her latest novel, which is um, called Writing Against a Loveless World. Um, and I'm just wondering, to us younger um, Black academics, writers, poets, um, how would you say that we, um, you know, I mean, you, 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 you've been speaking about, um, you know, sort of um, every, every poem is in a way a political poem. And I was wondering whether you could um, elaborate on how do we keep the black consciousness flame um, burning? How do we carry black consciousness forward? Because, um, we all know, so many people have written about it, um, um, you know, that um, Black consciousness was wonderful, but it had its flaws. Um, and um, But in the current um, climate of this country and of the world, really, um, Black consciousness, um, in my mind, is so important. And I was just wanting um, to hear your thoughts about how do we, um, how do we, how do we keep engaging? Um, how do we mm. think in Black consciousness? At this point in time. Thank you. Yeah, I I I entered university in the 1970s, 1973, in fact, and uh, in in Cape Town at the University of the Western Cape, in those segregated years. And that was a time when uh, black consciousness uh, emerged. In fact, it emerged on the black campuses. The University of uh, Durban Westville and the medical school for for, for so-called non-whites in uh, in Durban and at the University of the North Turflu. and it was it was also a a strong presence of it in at the University of the Western Cape. The strategy, of course, was to uh, it was it was to, to to 
overcome the uh, divisions and the, the, the fragmentation. The apartheid system was a systematic classificatory system to divide people in a hierarchical order. They went so far in the, in the divisions that they even created two, two homelands, the, the Transcar and the Siske. And I had spent some time in the Transcar in the late 70s and early 80s. Now, these are Tosa speaking people. <laughs> and uh, there, was a, there was a republic of the Siske and a republic of uh, the Transcar in order to divide, you know, a, a, a relatively large body of people uh, in order to, 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 to maintain a minority domination. And it was done all across, all across our cultures and our languages. So uh, black consciousness, Really, its roots are in, uh, in, 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 in the 1960s America, the Black Power Movement. Uh, if you read Steve Biko, and I've written extensively on, on Biko's cultural theories and ideas, uh, which, which are reactions against a, a racist a domination in a society where one group elevates itself above the rest and treats the, the rest of society as uh, people you could just classify and throw into, into, uh, into territories which they must, they must consider to be their homeland. In America, the, uh, the uh, indigenous peoples, you know, <laughs> you, you think South Africa, South Africa was bad when I was studying there. Uh, and I worked very closely with the anti apartheid movement and the ANC. And I looked and tried to work with the Native Americans and, of course, the African Americans. Brought their slaves and, and they survived. But what was done to the, to the Native Americans, it's more or less what was done to the uh, Khoisan in the Western Cape, uh, when the, the, the settlers uh, arrived and uh, expanded, uh, same thing happened to, to the Native Americans. And I always said that when I was there, you know, I, I'm not going to stay in America, I'm going home. We are going to be liberated. Why? Because despite all the policies that were followed by the apartheid government, the black population grew. Year after year, the numbers increased. And the policies were, were designed to, to, to uh, put such pressure, survival pressures on the communities that they would wither and eventually sort of collapse, but it didn't happen. So he said, no, I'm going home to South Africa. We are going to be free. And my heart bleeds for what was done to the to, to Native Americans. And uh, uh, mercifully, after, after cent centuries of, of exclusion, we had a relatively, let's say relatively, but we mustn't say it was bloodless. Many people lost their lives. Great suffering was inflicted on communities, but uh, 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 except for the for the uh, genocide in in, in in the Western Cape, uh, the, the the people excluded from power in South Africa survived that uh, long history of colonialism. So we were the last. I said I used to I said to the Americans, "No, I'm going home because we are going to be free." And uh, it just so happened. I said, "I can't wait. I don't want to." get back home when everything is, uh, is, is over. So I left my university job and took a job in publishing because I wanted to be closer to, uh, to what was going on in South, South Africa. So black consciousness, you know, um, must be seen as, as an intervention in relation to uh, conditions which uh, denied the humanity of, of people called blacks. You know, I always say 
I've never seen a black person in South Africa. They all look to me a bit brownish, maybe further north, you know, whatever. Uh, but this black and white thing, you can just see how absurd it is. Have, I, have you ever seen a white person, someone as white as this piece of paper? I don't think I have. It's a political system. It's an ideology. It's, it's, it's informed by racism. So black consciousness was a counter. But we must see it as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a bridge, as a bridge out of out of the the the, the internment uh, conditions of colonialism towards an open society, and ultimately, ultimately, uh, we must find fusions between uh, extreme cultures and exchanges and interactions, and not. Uh, 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 a retreat into camps, as it were. Why do we write poetry? Why do we make art? Because we we, we want to speak to people. We want to 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 impart something that is in us to to towards other people. Language, literature, art, music. It's all about. Uh, our shared humanity, as opposed to you know the uh, the the, uh, <laughs> the 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 demented uh, uh, classification of human beings, the divisions uh, erected between them, and it only causes misery and it causes hatred and violence. Uh, uh, what uh, black consciousness did was to assert a, 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 an African humanism in relation to a colonial sort of culture that uh, was, uh, was, was, uh, was, 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 was uh, uh, intoxicated by supremacy and in which the human beings are as classified like plants and animals, a hierarchical system of the superior and the inferior. What we must work for is a truly humanist world in which gender, nationality, religion, whatever the cultural markers are that we as human beings are born into or decide to embrace uh, the diversity and, uh, is, 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 is a gift of richness and it, it provides opportunities for exchange and co collaboration. So black consciousness, yes, was necessary to uh, counter the destructive racist uh, thrust of, of apartheid. Um, and uh, his, his work is probably not finished, but we are faced with new challenges now. Uh, uh, we, we are uh, black people, the majority uh, are in government, they are in power. They, they, we, are, we are no longer marginalized and excluded. But uh, if, we, if we dwell in the past and we didn't see the possibilities before us to remake the world in a new sort of way of inclusiveness, justice for everybody, for women, for children, for, for, for whatever, and, and stop this othering and this, uh, this narcissism that is that is uh, that is often uh, part of ethnic identities. Uh, we are all just human beings, and the sooner we, we embrace that, the more happier we will be, the more successful our societies will be, the more creative we will be, the more we will communicate, exchange between people and cultures the better the world will become. Now, even where there are cultural differences, these are not barriers, insurmountable barriers, or, 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 or the, the, uh, the justification for, for segregation and all that stuff. Uh, uh, the world, imagine a, a world you, when you, if you walk into the garden and there's only one plant there, just one plant all over the, the earth, everywhere you turn. Nature is diverse. 
or there's just one type of bird and one type of dog and one type of this and one type of that. Diversity is a resource. Uh, we cannot erase, you know, the gender differences between, you know, uh, human beings, but that is not a reason to support prejudice, exclusion, exploitation, and abuse. And that's where we fail because we withdraw into camps. And the writing, literature, and the art is open, wants to open, wants to open uh, ourselves to, 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 to the aesthetics. That is the, 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 the beauty that is in, in nature, in, in languages, in the different languages, in the cultures, the wonderful music, you know, produced by people all over the earth, the great poetry that's been written all over the ages from, from uh, the Khoisan to the Greeks. All that is our inheritance. All of that is part of what makes us human. And, and, and although it doesn't elevate us above nature, but uh, it, uh, it uh, redeems us from being brutish beasts. Thank you so much Paul, for that response. Um, so I'm just gonna ask everyone one more time to unmute yourselves and offer a round of applause. Thank you so much for gracing us at the wheelbarrow and for sharing your work with us and your thoughts. So thank you. Thank you once again for the invitation. It was my pleasure and honor. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Um, thank you. So we um, have one final part of the session after the poetry reading. Uh, we'll take a short break and then there will be the open mic. The open mic will, um, we invite everybody in the room who's still around and able to stay to read one of their own poems or to share a poem from a poet that they admire um, in the space. I will not be um, running the open mic, but my colleagues at the wheelbarrow will be taking over from me. So thank you to everybody who was here with us. And uh, I should stop recording. <laughs> um,